trip, and we're both the Humanities Teacher Leader Fellows for the state of Maine, and uh, so it's our responsibility to create newsletters every week, so feel free to sign up for those. Um, and uh, at the end of each month, we have a professional development opportunity, and there's sort of a lot of movement right now across the state to develop um, the, the skill of asking questions in the classroom, or asking good questions in the classroom, and so this is sort of a part and parcel to that movement. Um, I know that they have, starting today, actually, a, a three-week online course uh, with the Right Questions Institute that um, develops the, the skill of asking the right questions. Um, and so I think I'll review that at some point in the, in the presentation. Um, uh, feel free as, as we're going through this to, you know, to chime in and, and ask any questions. You can, um, you can chat them as well, but um, you know, it, sometimes it's nice to have com um, conversations with, um, you know, regarding the content because we get in the flow and sometimes we don't realize we're missing things or maybe we're going too fast. So we really encourage you to try and, uh, you know, to stop us and, 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 you know, engage us with any questions. And then at the end, there's also some, um, you know, time for questions and exchanges as well. All right. Well, without further ado, why don't we get started? I'm going to share my screen. Oops. Sorry about that. I'm going to go to the slideshow here. Can everybody see it? They're asking the right questions. I can. Um, so I guess one of the biggest questions, one of the first things we have to ask ourselves, because every, everything is about asking questions, everything is everything about growth and, and critical critical thinking, which is a, particularly a focus in, in my classes. I teach at the academy, uh, Freiburg Academy, which is a high school. Uh, but my wife also asks quite a few questions with her kindergartners, and she teaches at the K level. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was reviewing s some of the reasons and some of the um, uh, the benefits of asking the right questions. A lot of these uh, are addressed by businesses, not just in, in the world of education. And so some of these were the best write-ups were about why it's important and um, and how asking the right questions can benefit sort of all aspects of our lives. So I just wanted to touch on some of these here. So the power of why, how asking the right questions can change the future um, is from February. What I particularly liked about this was the um, the quotes here by all these significant figures like Carl Jung said, the right question is already half the solution to a problem. Um, w. Edwards Deming, uh, if you do not know how to ask the right question, you discover nothing. Uh, Thomas Watson, who was, I guess, the uh, CEO of IBM for 40 years, the ability to ask the right question is more than half the battle of finding the right answer. Oprah Winfrey, everybody's favorite resource, ask the right questions and the answers will always reveal themselves. And Einstein, of course, if I had an hour to solve a problem. I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper questions to ask. But once I know the proper question, I can solve the problem in less than five minutes. And it goes on and it talks about the nature of um, all of the benefits of asking good questions, right? So it lists them here. They facilitate learning and discovery. Uh, they help solve problems by exploring why things don't work, right? That's another way of doing it. They stimulate innovation and then the list goes on in this fashion as well. There's also six underlying benefits uh, in this article of asking questions. This is in Success Magazine. It deals with, um, with businesses. And so I'm just going to scroll through the major headings here. We learn about life through questions. The more we question, the better answers we get. The quality of our lives depends on the questions we ask. Questioning makes you open. Questioning makes you wiser. And asking the right questions creates happiness. Right. And you can go into more detail and depth with those. And I have to agree with all of these. That's why we find that I think the most educated people are the ones who have been trained to ask questions. Um, I, don't, I don't mean to be biased in that in that statement, but um, they've uh, they have the training, they they have the background to keep their minds open about uh, exploring things and asking questions about them. Um, so great detail uh, in some of those articles about the the power of asking the right questions throughout not just education and learning, but, you know, life beyond that as well. All right. So we have to, you know, explore why do we ask questions in the classroom? And there's a host of different reasons. And everybody asks different questions for different reasons. And here are some of the most common responses, right? To check for comprehension, uh, to assess knowledge, to gauge attention levels, to redirect students, to promote dialogue, to enable students to think critically and differently, to stimulate independent thinking, and to create 
discussion. And um, here's an article that deals with some of these, especially the last three are the ones which uh, I think are, are some of the most powerful, we ask the right questions. And we'll get into the difference um, between the types of questions we ask and how some can actually be harmful in the classroom versus some that can really empower students to, 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 um, to think for themselves and to engage in classroom discussion and ideas. And so this uh, using effective questions from Cornell University, their Center for Teaching Innovation, um, goes through a lot of the things I'm touching on here. Why ask questions, uh, considerations for developing and using effective questions, and getting started with designing effective questions. And they refer to Bloom's taxonomy, which I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with, but that's the different levels of, um, of thinking abilities, right? From uh, just remembering up to creating. So the um, better the question, the higher on the taxonomy will be, and Bloom's taxonomy will be with our questions. Um, and so furthermore, what is the purpose of asking questions, uh, right? All of these reasons for asking questions have great value and I use them all, every day when I teach as well. But I'm really conscious when I wanna get into depth about how I structure a question, right? Because some questions are less constructive than others and some can even discourage students from taking risks or participating, right? So what will happen is a lot of teachers will have the answer in mind and they'll ask the question, the, the class to answer it. What was the, why, why did, uh, you know, Willem E. Conquer invade England? And some of them may have their own questions, but we have an agenda, right? We want a specific answer. And the more we ask answer questions that we require specific answers to, the, um, the more time students have to get the answer wrong, right? Because that's not an answer coming from them, that's an answer coming from content that we want them to have, right? So the best questions are one that empowers students and leads them to greater levels of inquiry and enable discussion. I just wanna to check to make sure that there's nobody um, else coming in here, just um, a second. No, I, sorry. Yeah, oops, I want to go back. Right. Um, so, what good questions do is they empower students and lead them to greater levels of inquiry and they enable discussion and it enables in a way that they feel confident about it, that they have something to share rather than seeking and trying to find what we want them to share. So good questions tap into students in innate curiosity. Students have it and they even, my, my wife has it with kindergartners and I, I have it with high school students. They, all students are curious to some degree. We just have to make sure the question taps into that. And it gives them the confidence to explore. Um, so a couple of articles here that deal with this, The Right Way to Ask Questions in the Classroom by Ben Johnson, um, which reviews common questioning methods. And then he proposes what was called the total physical response. So I'm gonna to go to this article. If you're not familiar with Edutopia, it's a really great resource for uh, practical methods in the classroom. I mean, there's philosophical stuff on this as well. It's founded by George Lucas, but it's a good go-to place to get started when you're working with um, different teaching concepts. So um, posing a question to class, allowing time to think, and then calling on a student and one simple strategy for engaging students in a better academic course. And he goes on. It, it talks about a lot of the different methods, classroom observations that um, that engage a more dynamic classroom. But um, the simple and effective approach he, he recommends is a total physical response. Right. And oh, I'm sorry about the Wikipedia, but this is the link they had, which is developed by James Asher. Um, and it's based on the coordination of language and physical movement. And this is sort of like a mnemonic device, which um, when you have a, a question, there has to be some physical connecting to it. So some people may put a question on the wall and have the students go up and write. Um, so the more physical activity they have with a question, the more involvement they have, and the more different senses are involved, which I thought was an interesting uh, approach to it that um, I, I've done sometimes. I never really put it to this to this particular language. So I thought that was an interesting way, sort of like a mnemonic device. Um, so here's a common model, right? Where you ask a question with an expectation of a specific answer. So students are often incorrect, right? Which is discouraging and they'll stop taking those risks if they know they have a question that they wanna answer, they wanna be engaged and they keep getting it wrong. You know, why take, why take risks like that? Um, Another one is it doesn't allow them to explore their own ideas, right? Students have a lot to offer and we want to engage um, the interests that they have and their experiences. And so a good question will take advantage of that. Um, 
believe it or not, the, the common question in, that we have here where we have sort of an agenda and you, have, you answer a question with the expectation of getting a specific answer often favors males over females in, in terms of um, males being more dominant in class discussions, not always, but as a I hate to generalize, but it's often the case. Um, and it also, uh, I've served as a department chair several times in my um, capacity as an educator. And, uh, and I've been to a lot of workshops and um, we find that, and I find as well, and I have to be aware of that, a lot of us teach to the male presence in our classroom for whatever reason, whether it's behavioral or social, whatever it is. And so that's something that we often have to be aware of. And so very often our questions will be geared towards what the, ma the male students will uh, respond to. Um, and so when I'm observe observing teachers, I ask, I, I often will observe how often they probe deeper with the male students versus the female students, how often they will um, seek out um, somebody who's raising the hand as a male or a female. And we find that there's a very uncommon but un unacknowledged um, bias towards, uh, you know, against it's nothing that anybody's doing consciously. It just happens to be part of it. So. Um, finding questions that appeal to everyone is important. Um, often marginalize underrepresented students as well because it's coming from a cultural bias. So the questions that we want to make sure that they can be tapped into by everybody. Um, one of the best examples I had was how the SAT is often very biased against, uh, you know, underrepresented students because even though they may be brilliant, they may not know what a teacup is. But if the question is all about teacups, they're going to um, they're going to miss out on. So we want to make sure that the questions are inclusive. And um, questions that have a, a specific agenda, a specific required, you know, a specific required answer favor above all else, verbal thinkers. Right? Um, and I'm going to get to that, the difference between a verbal thinker and an internal thinker in a minute. Um, so here's, um, you know, Way, what ways to think about questions when you're constructing them, right? Even with this format, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a format in a minute. Um, uh, I have to be aware of the kinds of questions I ask. So I have a discussion format that I use, which I'll, I'll explain in a second. If they're intended to elicit, elicit a specific answer, then they are limiting students' abilities to explore the ideas on their own. That's really what I want, particularly when students are talking with each other and they're reporting to their class. So, they should be open to interpretation. They allow for many ways for the students to connect. None of them are wrong. They're just, uh, you know, it opens up, up for many of them to bring in their own experiences and it encourages them to take risks. That's big for me. Asking questions encourage students to take risks. Um, and that means putting themselves out there intellectually and, and taking, uh, you know, risks in, in terms of trying new ideas out. It can be a really empowering part of class. And um, when I first started teaching, it was always me talking and telling the students and limiting how much they had to contribute. And then once I sort of switched things around, I came to find that there's a lot more content that they were able to, you know, to wrap their minds around when it wasn't just coming from me. Right. So here's some examples of some open questions, right? What are several possible themes explored in this story? I'm not giving them a specific theme here. So these are things I've used and there's some down that my, my wife has used as a K teacher. Obviously they can be adapted for any classroom and content. Um, what are these characters' motivations? What questions do you have about the story, the song or the poem or the music or whatever you're studying? Um, what ways does this story connect with others in a view? You know, so they're making connections to other things that we've read and they're bringing their own experiences into the exchange. Um, how might other people view this story differently and why? In what ways does this story connect to your life or your experiences or your family? And what do you see here that is interesting? In what ways do these concepts connect, right? There's our um, ways for them to explore without having a specific agenda at the end, right? It's just ways to interact and then to engage and, and sort of um, have a dialogue with each other about the content. All right, so the right question should allow students who think differently the scope to develop their own reactions to something, right? And so here's an example. Uh, 
Here's one way, so I have them paired up, right? How do you think you would react in a similar situation compared to the way the character reacts versus how does the ca character react in this situation? So the second one here, we have a specific, there's a specific response to that, right? The character, this is a summary, whereas the, the top one um, helps, help, enables the student to connect to the situation and then um, bring their own experiences in. Um, and so here's another example. How do the parts of this song differ versus which part of the song is fast and which is slow, right? Um, the second one here, once again, has an agenda. You know what part is fast, you know which is slow, and you want that right answer, right? First one allows them to explore the different connections. All right. And a big thing, um, and I'm going to explain an example of this in a few seconds, but one of the biggest things regarding uh, asking the right questions is allowing students the time to think. Um, we want to give value to their answers. We want to give value to the process of thinking, of, you know, making connections in our, in our heads and their heads, right? So they need to be given some time. And it's okay for there to be that silence. And a lot of teachers are uncomfortable with it. I'm working with a younger teacher now who feels she needs to fill up all of the space in the classroom. If the student's not talking, then she has to be talking. And she's a fabulous teacher, but um, I, I want her to understand it's okay for there to be quiet, to be thought about um, somebody filling that space up. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I want to get back. I, I mentioned earlier that um, very much agenda-based questions, ones that have a specific answer in mind when you ask them, will favor verbal thinkers versus internal thinkers, right? Um, because they like to process verbally. Uh, so they're the first to discuss and respond during class. They're, they're willing to take the risks. They're willing to shout out the answer, even if they're wrong, because that's how they process information. They often dominate a class discussion. Um, the teacher often discusses topics directly with them because there's a, you know, they're actually in the minority in many classes. And so the student develop, and the teacher develop a relationship and the teacher asks a question that student answers and just goes back and forth very often. And then when the teacher wants more people to, um, to engage the class, to, to contribute, to participate, we'll often have to tell that student to, to, you know, try not to answer the next question. And then they become discouraged. And, um, and they also perceive time differently from internal thinkers. Uh, and so I'll explain that in a second, sorry. So internal thinkers are equally active as verbal thinkers. And, and these are the students that are often um, penalized for not talking in class or, or, or paying attention. And there's certainly some students for sure that, that zone out whenever, you know, people are talking or whatever. But I, I know there's also some very attentive students who process internally, right? They have to think a question through before they're ready to answer. They need time to consider. So that, that, where that time becomes such an important part of, of the process of asking a question and then offering the time for them. Often their voice is unheard because the discussion has moved on when they've been considering the question. So the teacher will engage with the verbal thinkers, you know, who are process things verbally. And then that will move on. And by the time the internal thinker has processed the question, we moved on to another one. Um, and then in classes with participation expectations, their grade suffers, right? And at no fault of them out of their own because their strengths are not being are not being registered, right? Because they have very good things to say. Um, they're just not given the forum where they're able to access it. So there's a case study on this. I had a colleague, um, and he's the one that really, this is years ago when I was early years of my teaching, who uh, was very aware of the difference between verbal thinkers and internal thinkers. And so um, he, he had his most verbal thinker in the middle of this room. He put him at a table and he put the verbal thinker on one spot. And then he put his most internal thinker in the one sp in another spot across table right in the center of the room everybody was watching and uh the internal thinker in this case happened to be a girl and the verbal thinker happened to be a boy and he said okay it, here's the rules i'm going to ask you a question and the boy the verbal thinker you can't say anything until the girl the internal thinker says and, and offers her idea and so i can't remember what question he asked but it was really controversial you know most people would have a strong reaction to it and um and so the time passed, right? And she was thinking and, and considering. And then of course, once she offered up her opinion and he was given the window to talk, he just sort of, you know, just went, went, he just exploded with ideas. It was like a volcano of ideas uh, because that's how he needs to process the information. 
And then at the end of that discussion, uh, the teacher, my colleague said, okay, so tell me how much time do you think passed between the time I asked the question and the time the girl, the internal speaker, thinker, spoke? And she said, oh, and this, they were very honest with their reactions. And she said, oh, maybe, maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds at most. And, um, and the boy said it had to have been three or four minutes. And it was about probably a minute and a half that had actually passed. But their perception of that time was much different because of how engaged they were with processing the information differently. Um, and so um, this is a huge discrepancy. This is the format that I was referring to earlier. Uh, in, in teaching, I actually had a, reviews. A we have yearly reviews on our teaching. And although some of it you got to filter out, there are some, you can get some good content from them. One was that there, the students felt like they weren't getting the ability to contribute in class as much as they'd like to. Excuse me. So I, I created this group cooperative discussion based on that. Um, and so every time in my classes, I'll enlarge this. So it's okay. Right. Every time students, I won't bring you through all the discussions, but essentially, um, on a single study, whatever the unit is that we're studying, they'll break up into these groups and they'll take roles. There's a facilitator. He has a responsibility of maintaining the focus of the group during discussion, right? And bringing students in that are drifting or, or redirecting the discussion. There's a person who writes down what's going on in this discussion. And then there's the reporter. And this is the person that has to explain to the whole group what, um, what uh, ideas the group came up with regarding the questions that we're dealing with. And um, they have to switch these roles. So we may have like three or four discussions for a book and nobody can be the reporter twice or the reporter twice or the facilitator. They have to, they have to switch the roles. Um, if there's more students, they can share the roles. Um, so that's the rotation idea. And then um, eventually, of course, those ideas will be aired out to a full discussion. And so in this, in this way, um, they will have discussed the groups together in small, in small, you know, comfortable groups where they, they sort of have to discuss so that there's enough people and enough ideas to spread. But this gives voice to those people that need the time to think. It allows them to process this information before we talk about it as a group. It also gives them the opportunity to contribute because if they're the reporter, they have to talk to the whole group. Um, and so they get to, you know, they don't feel like um, they can wait on somebody else to report. They, they're the ones that get to do it. Um, and then, um, I, I don't like necessarily grading on participation, um, but I will have the students grade each other because in that small group format, everybody has a responsibility to exchange ideas and to give each other time. And so they have to grade each other. And this actually goes in the rank book based on the, their criteria of preparation, fulfillment of those roles, uh, contribution to a group discussion, attitude and overall effort. Um, and so I tell them the minimum preparation is having read or considered the material that we're going to be working in the class. That's a one. You know, other than that, they have to think about it. They have to consider things from the class. And they have to make those connections as we go through. Um, so that's one way of doing it. But I'm always aware, too, of how I'm constructing questions because um, I want them to lead somewhere in the classroom. I want them to to bring the students in to the discussion. I want them to feel engaged and, co and connected to the, the material, right? So good questions can lead a classroom to many places. Um, and the biggest thing is an exchange of ideas in the form of discussion, right? That's in, in the English classroom. It's, that's the case in my wife's classroom in the kindergartens, they can exchange ideas as well. That's the purpose of it in ways that they feel confident about um, discussing. Um, and so discussion, of course, is a part and parcel to asking a good question. Um, and discussion leads to a better understanding of the, of the material, engaging with content and with each other. Create a forum where students can ask questions, model how to create a good question, model critical thinking and foster critical thinking. <laughs> All huge elements of discussion and questions need to lead us in that direction. And my wife actually... She has um, students when they're reading nonfiction. Remember, she reads um, K, she teaches K1. We'll have them have a, a nonfiction book and they have to ask several questions. You know, what do I understand? What do I need to understand more? What don't I understand? 
And um, and then and then they need to share that with a friend, and they need to talk with a friend about that content. And then, then from there, they can go to a teacher if they need more. But that engagement allows that they love it. By the way, she said they can't get enough of that. They could do it all day. They like to, of course, they like to share their own ideas and doing it in a, such a constructive fashion helps them to figure out um, the difference between a statement and a question how to engage, how to listen to others, how to work off of what other people are thinking and, and asking, um, and not just have sort of a parallel discussion, but one that's interactive. And so the role of the instructor really is we want to be organizing responses and asking students to probe deeper and support their ideas, right? Um, so I try to ask questions where they can bring their own ideas in, but I don't let them just escape with surface questions, surface answers, right? And so my job is to ask them questions that allow them to go into more depth with their own connections, their own ideas. Um, and, um, and to sort of make sure that the, the, there's an organic feel to the class that, you know, when we're doing the group discussion, it's just not one person, but each group has the ability to contribute. Um, and making sure that I both model good questions and I have them practice that, right? So every time if we're studying, like right now in one of classes, we're studying the Bible, we're studying the gospel, we're getting ready for a biblical illusion unit. And so um, I'll ask them, okay, so what was the purpose behind um, what this figure was teaching? And then um, I'll say, now come up with your own question about this figure. What are things you want to, you think would help us get deeper into that? So they have to develop their own questions as well. And methods for the lower grades, we're not getting as much depth. I teach at the high school level, but um, my wife still, that's all the whole day is all about asking questions, right? Um, and so here's an example that she shared with me of um, they're open-ended in nature and there's no really wrong answer. So this creates a real strong sense of comfort or, or confidence when answering questions, even in the younger grades, right? What do you think? How do you know this? What questions do you still have? Why do you think this? And can, can you tell me more about this? And so um, they're able to bring their own limited but still powerful experiences into this discussion. Um, and another way, and I know, Dora, you've done this more than I have in your classrooms, and this is a wonder wall. It's a great book, I think. Curious Classroom, I think. The name of it's called The Curious Classroom, which deals a lot with wonder walls. Um, and they're a great way, great way to celebrate questions as a class community, encourage students to, um, to practice inquiry, to take risks. Um, and they like to see their names up on the wall. So it's something that they're proud of, both in terms of their ability to question, but their ability to actually have something they can contribute in a physical way in the class. And this extends class discussion and allows for different forms of participation. Dory, have you used this method before? Yes, I have. Um, I like it because it also um, helps you model, you know, how to find the answers to some of the questions, um, like researching answers. So I also teach elementary school um, and I'm actually a music teacher. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's like we're studying music um, from another country or something and students have a question about the composer or the country of origin or something and I don't know that information right off the top of my head it's like let's put that on a sticky stick it up on the wonder wall and then in like another class um, the next time I see them you know we pull out look for areas for inf information where can we go to find the answer to our question um, which often sometimes also sparks more curiosity and other questions. So <laughs> what starts with one sticky note turns into like 10 sticky notes and it's great. Um, it's a really great interactive way to um, some students that maybe might not raise their hand to ask a question or share something that they're wondering. Um, I find that they are more than willing to write it down and then stick it on the wall before they leave class. I've been, I've been trying to consider how to do this. There's a lot of movement in my classroom. You know, I, I'm in and out and there's um, obviously a lot of students, but a way for them to do the same thing in a meaningful way for high school students. Because I, I like that 
that that sort of has a strong presence in the classroom. The the inquiry that the, the questions on the wonder wall provide. It is challenging if you teach like multiple sections or grade levels. So like I teach kindergarten through fifth grade, um, but we've we've got a color coded system. So each grade uses a different color sticky note, and we kind of just organize them as best we can. Um, I do have some fifth grade students that love to come in um, during um, breakfast time or something like that to rearrange the sticky notes for me or to like make a little sticky note map, <laughs> which is also um, a great way for them to be thinking about the questions that are being asked as well. Um, uh, one thing that, that really helps as well is the idea of metacognition. And um, I don't mean to condescend it. I'm sure all of you know this, but just so we're on the same page. And so that's really considering how you're thinking. And uh, this is even something that can be done on the younger age, right? Does it does, and when I, does it make sense? So here's on the right here is a little little here about metacognition. Does does what I'm saying make sense? Does that really make sense? Um, do I understand what I'm reading? What can I do if I don't understand it? These are the these are the methods my wife is using with her kindergarten. Right. What can I do if I don't understand something? What questions can I ask that will help me to better understand it? Um, and uh, this little light bulb on the left here, um, you know, I th I'm thinking you want to use these words as part of it. She uses these. I'm noticing, I'm wondering, I'm seeing, I'm feeling. And, uh, and it's a really powerful tool. And I'll tell students, how are you thinking? How are you thinking? What questions are you asking about this, this problem? And uh, how does this reflect the way you're thinking? And so that in itself really helps them consider problems in different ways. And I tell them about, and I'm probably going off tangent, but it's an interesting story because there was a time when I was purposely trying to think like somebody smarter than I am. And I was at a, it was um, a dinner theater and the, the people acted everything out. And this was in Wyndham, I think years ago. And I said, okay. At the end, we have to write down who we think the murderer is in the murder in the dinner theater and then submit that. And I said, okay, I'm going to think about this as if I'm, I was somebody smarter. And I did. And I ended up actually winning um, because I was thinking about it in a much more logical way. And I was thinking about the way I was thinking. So uh, that's pretty much an aside there, but I thought it was an interesting note. Um, and so as you reflect on your own practices, how do you ensure all the voices are heard? In your classroom, and what methods do you usually employ during discussion, and what what changes do you think need to be made? And so, this is a good time to sort of open it up to a general discussion. If anybody has anything they want to offer, um, I know we all have our own methods in our classroom, and I'm wondering how you go about creating questions and how you get students to model them. And you can feel free to chat or to. Um, um, uh, just uh, chime in if there's any if you don't have any questions or offerings. So we're talking about establishing inquiry in a sense, if I understand your question correctly. Yes, yeah, I think that's one way of, one good way of looking at it. Right. Um, I'm only an intern teacher at the moment uh, with mathematics, but something I find helpful when students don't ask questions is to like give them and example problem or like just any sort of example of like like a question or a challenge that they might not have thought of before that takes what they learned and applies it in a different way or asks them to think outside the box of the normal way they learn in order to solve and I'll be like okay so we'll break it down piece by piece what is the first thing we need to do here what is our goal at the end of this problem? But is although with Dorian and I, the humanities uh, teachers, I think that with a lot of math, that would that's sort of a question, right? You present them with a math problem. That's a way of asking a question, getting them to think differently. Yeah, I mean, so um, when I used to teach, um, because I'm not teaching right now at the moment. Um, I always loved the idea of questioning because it was a way to engage all of the students in your classroom. And, um, and I taught middle school. And 
and I would let them know, you know, right at the beginning of the year when we started, um, that I didn't just always interact or call on the students who would raise their hand. Um, and so anybody in the class um, I might talk to or ask questions of. Um, and I think you had mentioned this earlier, wait time is really important, I found, that you are asking students some questions and give them a little bit of time to respond that the silence is okay. Um, and one of the things, at least that worked well with middle school, was a student would answer. Um, and then I would say to another student, what do you think of that? What were your thoughts around that? And then sometimes students would be like, well, I don't know. Um, and I also found then a good method was, that's perfectly fine. You think about that a little bit and I'll come back to you later on in this class. And, and then I always did go back to them. Um, and by that time they would have something to say. Yeah, that's a great method, particularly with uh, when you have a lot of internal thinkers in the classroom, right? They just need that extra time to process because they still have a lot to offer, but they're often um, not acknowledged. And, and sometimes that is a good way to invite the really quiet people, of which I was one, um, to participate, you know, a way to bring them in. Yeah, and, and it's a way without them having to take too many risks, but giving them confidence. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I have something to share. Um, so one thing that I do sometimes in my classroom, um, I start with a task um, instead of an ask, so to speak. So, you know, if like we're starting something new or even in review of something, I will give students a task. So for example, today, that might've looked like my fourth grade, my fourth graders are learning a new song on their recorder and they were looking at it for the first time. And I gave them the task of, okay, I want you to, sit quietly, um, put your recorder on your chin, and I want you to try playing through this song, right? Go through it on your own on your on your chin. And then, so that required, I don't know, maybe five minutes or less of like quiet time where students were actually able to kind of really look at the music, the internal thinkers thinking about it. Maybe they didn't, like if I had asked, what do you see? What do you notice at first? They might not have known what to ask or to say, but after they tried playing it, the task, okay, well, what did you notice as you were going through? What were some, were there, you know, and the answers were, well, I noticed there was a pattern. I noticed there's a new note that I don't know how to play, um, you know, and it would spark other conversations as well. Turn and talk to a partner about something that you noticed in this snippet that we were just looking at. So sometimes starting with, um, a task prior to the discussion helps um, kids think of what they want to say or need to say. And then also I find too, um, just for literacy purposes, providing like some sentence starters um, for some kids too, um, or like like a bank of things that could be said as well sometimes gets the ball rolling for students that might be a little more reluctant to, to share. Yeah, I, th I think that, um, that, that sort of that bank, that beginning helps them model the questions that they need to ask. And then that gives them something reliable. That they can do. Kate, I saw that you were unmuting before. Did you have some? Um... Yeah, well, I know I'm not actually in a classroom, you know, just an informal education setting at the museum. So um, I guess it's, can be a little trickier because we're only with students for maybe half an hour and that's the first time we've met them and then we never see them again. Mm -hmm. um, but it, this is making me think about um, the two virtual program models that we offer right now. Um, one, I think based on this uh, session today is in pretty good shape, which I'm excited about. We do a virtual primary source workshop. So students get um, a themed packet of sources. So it might be different artifacts or images or documents from Maine history. And the only two questions that we ask are, what do you see and what do you wonder? So that's very visual thinking strategy, very open-ended. They're coming up with conspiracy theories and like connecting it to their grandma's, you know, clay pot and like all this kind of stuff. 
Um, but our other programs are more traditional presentations on topics like, you know, rocks and minerals or logging or whatever it is. And those are very, you know, we have multiple choice questions that are like, you know, how many lobsters do you think survive to adulthood out of 10,000? So I feel like that's a very close ended. There's a right answer. They are making guesses and we don't expect them to know the answer, but I feel like that might not be as fun as I was thinking because no one wants to get it wrong, even if it's just a wild guess. So um, this is very helpful and, and thanks for all the input. And I'm, I'm gonna go back tomorrow and start brainstorming ways that on those more traditional presentations, we can try to open the questions up and make them a little bit more fun and interactive. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Well, that reminds me. Um, so we're going to post this. I'll post the. Um, we're going to send a video. The video. This video will be posted online on our website. I'll also make an attachment in our next couple of newsletters. But I'll I'll put this resource as well on the website and on our newsletter so that you can actually access the links if any of them find that. Right. Um, so here are some resources I thought might interest um, everybody. Um, the Right Question Institute. Is sort of the go-to resource for learning how to write the questions. Theirs is more of a catalyst for, you know, promoting a, a sort of a literate democracy. Um, but they have a lot of activities um, that you know you can engage in as an educator. Excuse me, and um, they have an online community that you can uh, become a member member of. Um, they they do have some videos here about using it in the educational world. They actually have quite a few for that. So that's really a big part of their mission. And um, so there's some great resources on the Right Questions Institute. And this is the institute that the Maine Department of Education is working on um, for uh, right here, February 29th, which starts today to the end of next uh, March. Um, it's an introduction to the question formulation technique. And so this is the Maine DOE inter interdisciplinary instruction team in collab collaboration with the Right Question Institute. It's hosting a three-week asynchronous course in the question formulation technique. And so you can click here for details on here as well. Not too late to sign up if you are interested in it. So just so you know, uh, the Maine Department of Ed is very, very supportive. Um, it hasn't been this way forever, but um, I found them to be really supportive in promoting um, teacher development uh, recently. So pretty much if you go on their website, you're going to find a lot of resources that they're not very good about promoting, but they're really helpful. Um, there's also this, I, I, I've taught um, critical thinking at the college level as well, and I've used asking the right questions. And although this is a bit advanced for high school, sorry about that, advanced. Uh, for um, high, even high school kids, unless you're in a you know advanced track, it does give you a lot of good basis for um, for asking questions and clarifying questions and, and helping kids to think about different issues. And so it's a good thing that you might be able to adapt. This, this is the free version. This is version eight, which isn't particularly different from version 12, but of course they, they come out with new versions every few years so they can sell them. But there's a free PDF of the eighth edition online, which can be something. Uh, and, oh, I guess I put that in there twice, sorry about that. Uh, something that you can access as well when you're trying to create questions from the classroom. And um, all right, that's it. Uh, we, there's contact hours. There's a Google form here that you can fill out. Um, and um, you're welcome to obviously come to our website. It's uh, main, it's humanities, there's, it's on the main department of ed. And so we have that on our newsletter as well. I and, put the link to the, to the survey for contact hours um, in the chat. It's just a really quick survey um, just so that we can send that off to you as possible, as quick as possible. Um, okay, oh, good, yeah, great. Uh, let's see. I love, uh, so some comments here. I love the one to wall. I asked them, if you had a question, what would it be? Or if you had an answer, what would it be? So that's great, really, op really open questions that they can engage their own strengths to respond to. So super um, ideas there. All right, if there's no other questions or comments, we've, um, I've, I've enjoyed talking. This is a real passion of mine, asking, trying to ask the right question. I don't know if I've gotten there yet, but it's something I'm working towards. 
So I encourage you all to keep 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 working at it. And so Dorian, I'll stick around if anybody wants to talk uh, about some other things or um, you're feel free to head out and we'll make sure that um, these resources are all posted so everybody has access to them. Great. Thank you all. Thank you so much. This was a great session. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. I agree. Thank you very much. Tatiana, are you still there? Did you have any did you have any questions? <laughs> oh, one new message here. Uh, oh, it's a survey. Good. Yeah, thank you for Sorry, posting. No. Yes. Okay. I'm just finishing the uh, survey. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Well, well, Thanks. I appreciate it. Um yeah, so that's great. You're very welcome. Close to the one hour mark. Mm -hmm. So that's not too bad. Not at all. Okay. Here all right, so. Good job. <laughs> are, you, are we still recording? Oh, yes. Hold on.